Hi, so yesterday we proved the following lemma. We proved that if f is an AC and uh, you have that f prime of x is equal to zero almost everywhere, then f is constant, okay? So, so do you think that this inclusion is it true? So the B V function intersected continuous function is contained in AC. You think it's true or there are some examples that <laughs> you can find a function that is which belongs to both but is not in AC in view of this. So for example, the counter function you have that is in BV, it's continuous, but it's not in AC because otherwise it's uh, I mean it's, it's zero almost everywhere and uh, it's, not, it's not constant, okay? Okay. Uh, okay, now we prove the last theorem of this, of this part, which is the characterization of absolutely continuous function. So it tells you that a function f, capital F, is an indefinite integral if and only if It is absolutely continuous. Okay, so proof. So with uh, with indefinite integral, I mean that f of x is equal to ax g t in the t with g integrable. Okay. So one side, you know, we already proved this one yesterday. So we have that if f is is of this type, you no, know, if f is is f of x, um, okay, we prove this. Is in AC. Okay, now we want to prove the converse. Of course, with this was uh, lemma. Mm. one of the lemma that we proved yesterday. OK. 
Okay, now we prove this, this side. Okay, so you know that we assume that, suppose that that f belongs to AC. Okay, then in particular it is of bounded variation. So we know that function of bounded variation can be decomposed as the difference of two uh, increasing function, okay? Okay, then or uh, non-decreasing, put it like function f1 and f2 such that we have that capital F is f1 minus 2. And moreover, we have f1 and f2 prime are integrable in view of the Lebesgue lemma, okay? Okay, so we have that f is equal to f, f prime, of course, is equal to f1 prime minus f2 prime. Okay, now we pass the integral. We have that a, b, we take the absolute values. or equal but we know that they are increasing so we can get rid of the absolute values so this is equal Okay, then here we apply the Lebesgue theorem because they are monotone function. So we have We have that this is less or equal than F1 evaluated in B minus F1 evaluated in A plus F2 in B minus F2 evaluated in A. So this is finite, okay? And so we have that F prime is So indeed, we know this. Okay, now, since we established that the derivative of f, big F, is, is integrable, 
it makes sense to define the indefinite integral by means of this f prime. So let g G of x would be defined as the integral between a and x of phi t in dt. And now we know that since f prime is integrable, yesterday we proved formal result we have that g being the indefinite integral of, uh, of, uh, of an integrable function g is, is in AC so now we prove this And now we consider this difference. Consider with, uh, for instance, little g, uh, little f, f of x, the difference between this big G and the big F. Okay, so we have that this is in AC. Okay, because the diff is the difference between two functions in AC. And now we are interested in computing the derivative. So you have that f prime of x is equal to f prime of x plus, uh, minus, sorry the derivative of this integral and this is by a previous theorem this is equal to f prime of x minus f prime of x which is of course is zero so what we prove is that the derivative almost everywhere maybe so what we prove is that uh, um, that f is constant okay by uh, the lemma that I recall you at the, at, the, at the beginning of the lecture because you, you have that f is in AC and f prime of x is equal to zero almost everywhere then you know that f is constant so it, Im it means that f of x is um, It's a constant plus the indefinite integral of ax f prime of x uh, f prime of t in dt. Okay, this is this would be f of a plus ax t. Okay, so this is actually a characterization which holds for function which are in AC, okay? So AC is the, is the, is the right class where to prove this, the, the fundamental theorem of, of calculus. Uh, 
okay, now we change a bit the argument and I will introduce the convex functions. May I raise here? This part. Okay, so I start by the definition, of course. So we consider a function phi defined in the open interval AB with values in R. And this function is said to be convex if you have that for any x and y in a b and uh, any lambda uh, we, we took lambda in between 0 and 1 we have that you know what we have So phi computed in the linear combination, no? phi <laughs> of lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y. So somehow it's any point between x and y is less or equal than lambda f of x, phi of x, sorry, plus 1 minus lambda phi y. Okay? Okay, geometrically, I'm sure that you already know what it means. So geometrically, you have that. Is that the chord between x and y between x, phi of x, these two points, and y, phi of y, lies above, is above, of the graph of phi, okay? So just to draw a picture. If you have x and y, so this chord is uh, is here. Now we are going to prove a lemma concerning the uh, the property of uh, convex function. And this lemma would be somehow a building, a building block for the next properties. So you have that if you start from a convex function phi defined in AB with values in R, then you have that. If you take x and y, uh, okay, of course, x and y in a b, no? which are different, and you define the function g in this way, somehow like an incremental quotient of phi of x minus, minus phi of y 
divided x minus y, then this function is increasing in each variable, so separately in each variable x and y, okay? Is increasing in the variable x and y. Of course, the definition is symmetric in x and y, no? Okay, so we, we prove this. So my error is here. Okay, so fix x and uh, we fix x and we prove, we think that x has a, a fixed parameter if you want and we prove that it is increasing in the variable y, okay? So let fix x in a b and let Okay, of course, we have many cases to consider in the sense if uh, uh, where x is, is placed with respect to y. So I, I will prove two and the other one are basically similar, okay? Okay, so we consider the case, consider first the case when you have that y and y prime lies on the same side of x, okay? So you have y prime, you take one y prime, which is larger than y, which is larger than x, the x that we fix. Okay, so what the, th the thesis would be g x um, y prime larger than g x y. This is what we want to prove. Okay, um, so uh, of course, since we have to, we have to, to use this, uh, this hypothesis that y is in between y prime and x, so we can express it as a linear combination. So since y is belongs to um, x and y prime, we have that there exists one lambda, lambda uh, between, so it's strict between 0 and 1, such that you have that y is equal to lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y, y prime. Okay, now of course you understand that we use a convexity, so we have that if we compute phi here, phi of y is equal to phi of lambda x, sorry, lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y prime. And so by convexity, this is less or equal than lambda times phi of x plus 1 minus lambda phi of y prime. Okay. Okay, now so we are interested in this in this quotient. Mm -hmm. 
And so we compute. Okay, so we compute g x y, which is phi y minus phi x divided y minus x. And the denominator is positive, okay? Uh, so by this, we have that this is less or equal. This is less or equal than, um, okay, lambda phi x plus 1 minus lambda phi y minus phi x divided y minus x. And this is equal if you collect phi of x. <laughs> um, so this is one mi uh, lambda minus one actually. So you have first you, we wrote this one minus lambda phi y prime. Uh, this is phi y prime. So you have a prime uh, minus <laughs> one minus lambda phi x divided y minus x. Okay. Then we observe that we can write y minus x has minus y minus lambda x plus y minus lambda y prime, which is equal to y1 minus lambda y prime minus x. <sighs> uh, okay, so finally, what you, what you get is that this is less or equal than phi y prime minus phi of x less than y prime minus x. And this is exactly g x y prime, okay? And so we are done. We are done for for the first case. So now we consider another case, uh, in the case when x is in between uh, y and y prime. So, Okay, so we have that by the step before you can <laughs> achieve what you want. You have that g x y are less than g y prime y, so here you apply on x and y prime. <coughs> this is symmetric, so this is g y y prime. And this is less, again, by the step before than g x y prime. And uh, again, you use this that is increasing with respect uh, so you, you think y prime fixed, uh, and you have that y and x lies on the same side of, uh, with respect to y prime, so we can use the step before, okay? Because here. Before, because uh, y and x lie on the same side, side with 
respect to uh, weight prime. Okay, the other cases can be treated analogously. So this is this concludes the proof. Okay, so with this proof we can prove many other properties, interesting properties of the convex function. So which are the following? Let me I cited them as a proposition. Okay, so we have phi in a b with values in r, b a convex function. Then we have the following fact. A, we have that phi is Lipschitz on each closed subinterval. of the type um, okay of a b the second fact is that so you have that the right and the left derivative of phi um, exist uh, at each point of AB you have the following inequality so you have that the left derivative which I don't know denote with a minus sign of 5x is less or equal than the right derivative of 5x of course for any x in a b and uh, d These two left and right derivatives are monotone increasing. Uh, okay, five x. And finally, you have that they coincide except on a countable number of points. Okay, so we prove <coughs> the point A. OK, 
Okay, so we have x and y in a b, and assume that, for instance, just to fix the idea that x is less than y. Ah, <laughs> I cancel out this part. And so by the previous lemma, the one that tells you that this function g is increasing in both variables, you can deduce the result Okay, so let me I, uh, let me first consider. Um, okay, before before doing this, uh, we have um, to to consider um, some a sub -E interval because uh, we have to prove this in each clause at sub -E interval. So we consider. A sub interval CD of a B. And then we know that there exists um, another interval uh, which is in between the two. No, actually, uh, an interval alpha beta which is still containing a B but contains this CD. OK, so you can find it. So basically what we have that, um, so we have that this is true. A is in between alpha, C, and then you have so less than D, less than beta, and less than uh, B. OK, then we took x and y. Uh, x and y belongs to CD because we are interested in proving <laughs> the fact that phi, <laughs> if phi is Lipschitz there. And so by the previous lemma, we have that uh, we have that phi C minus phi alpha C minus alpha is less than phi y minus phi x, phi minus x, less or equal than phi beta, minus phi d, b minus d. So in the end, what we have is that if you take the absolute values, you find that f of x minus y is less or equal than a constant times x minus y. OK. And so this constant would be precisely the maximum between these two in absolute values. Uh, so phi is Lipschitz. in CD. OK, to prove B, OK, to prove B, again, we use the previous lemma. Uh, OK, so let, let us fix some x in AB. And we define function g, g of h which is defined as phi of x plus h. Uh, so it's an incremental quotient. So for course, minus phi of x divided by x. So again, by the previous lemma, we have that uh, 
that G is increasing with respect to H. So we have that both the limit from the left and the right hand side exist and they are finite okay because phi is Lipschitz. So both the limit from uh, the right hand side and the left hand side. exist and they are finite and this is because we already know that phi is Lipschitz okay and then we have to prove point C Okay, so C tells you that um, the left hand side derivative is less or equal than the right hand side. Okay, so take uh, now one H positive, and again we use this function here. So you have that G minus H is what? Is phi of x minus h uh, minus phi of x minus h. This is less or equal and this is why it is because g is increasing. Then phi of x plus h minus phi of x divided by h, this is equal to g of h. And so the inequality is preserved when you take h, when you let h goes to 0, okay? So they take in take in the limit. plus then we then we are done okay finally point D So both derivatives are monotone increasing. Okay, so take x less than y. And so we consider fx plus h minus phi of x divided h. Um, is less than phi of uh, y plus h minus phi of y divided h and again you take the limit uh, from both sides so for h which go converts to zero from the left and from the side of, uh, from the from the left or from the right and then we have you obtain they are both monotone increasing mm. 
Okay, so what remains to prove is that they coincide except to a countable number of points. Okay, so So we have that, we observe that the left, for instance, the left, oh no, sorry, the right hand side, I mean, it's the same, has at most a countable number. of points of uh, discontinuities. And this is why it is monotone and, and finite, OK? Because it is. and finite on LB. OK, so we can take a point of continuity of uh, the right-hand side derivative. Okay, so we have that. Uh, if you have that, for instance, y is less than x by the previous lemma, you have two facts. One is that the x plus phi of x is less or equal than phi of x minus phi of y, x minus y less or equal than the x minus phi of x. This is 1. And by step C, we have another fact. So we have that the x minus phi of x is less or equal than the x plus phi of x. So we combine the two and what we get, we get that less or equal than the x minus phi of x or equal than plus phi of x. OK, but I recall you that x is a point of continuity for the phi of x plus. Then if we let y tends to x, we get the conclusion.
So if y tends to x, uh, then we are done, OK? Then the two coincide. OK, so this concludes the proof of the full lemma proposition. OK. And then OK, now we want to introduce the concept of uh, supporting lie of a convex function. But before doing this, we need a very quick result. And I couldn't, uh, you need this? OK. So it was just, uh, com you, you combine 1 and 2. And uh, here you get this. Uh, two inequalities, phi of y, OK? So you have a minus here. You have plus and plus. Here x and here y. You let y tends to x, and then you have uh, So if, again, you have, we start by a convex function now. And uh, mm, and let x naught be a point uh, in A B. Okay, we have that if we have M, which somehow plays the role of a slope, uh, is in belongs to this interval. Close at one. So dx minus of phi x not dx uh, plus phi x not. Okay, th this might reduce to just one point in view of, uh, but it can also be open. Then we have that phi of x is larger or equal than what is called the supporting line of, of phi. the proof. So we divide two cases. We have that if x is less than x naught, OK, then for what we saw before, we have that the incremental quotient of phi x, phi x naught, x minus x naught is less or equal than the x minus phi x naught, which is less or equal than m. OK. And so we prove because x is, ma is, uh, is less than x, x naught. OK, so the, 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 the sign are, are reversed. And uh, the other, if you prove the other way around, you have that analogously <coughs> is larger or equal than and so we are done.
Okay, just a brief definition. Okay, so. Have that. So the line y phi x naught plus m times x minus x naught is called the supporting line of phi. if it always lies <laughs> below the graph of phi. So namely you have that phi of x is larger or equal than f phi x phi of x, x naught plus m x minus x naught. This is for any x in a b. We prove the so called density inequality. So, do you know this inequality? Okay, so you have phi in a b in R a convex function and then you have uh, um, okay actually this time we have to let a equal to minus infinity and b equal to to plus infinity. So f is, uh, is defined in the whole uh, real line. And we assume that f is an integrable function one okay then the convex the Jensen inequality tells you that if you have think that the integral between 0 1 of Phi computed in f of T in DT this is less or equal than Phi of of the integral okay provided phi is convex okay so we prove this Okay, so we introduce alpha to be equal to the integral between 0 and 1 
of f of t in dt. Okay, this is of course is finite because uh, f is integrable. And we indeed we consider the supporting line at x naught at alpha actually and let y to be equal to m x minus alpha plus psi of alpha. And so the equation of the supporting line we have that f of t is larger or equal than m f of t minus alpha plus phi alpha. And then it is sufficient to integrate from both sides. with respect to t so we have that 0 1 okay so this is 0 because of our choice of alpha, and so and so we are done. Okay, so we have that indeed. So, and this concludes the proof of the Jensen inequality. Okay, we can consider now this exercise. Okay, so we consider a sequence, finite sequence of a positive number. And then we have the following. So we have that the geometric mean is always less or equal than the arithmetic one. Okay, this is a consequence of the of the Jensen inequality. So the geometric mean is the following: you take the product with this pi, I, I denote the product between this positive number, and then I write this to. Hmm? The the I equal one. Uh, okay, I. One over n is less or equal to one over n times the sum of B i. So this is the arithmetic mean. And this is the geometric one. So do you have an idea on how to prove this?
Okay, so the convex function that it is convenient to, to consider to prove this is the exponential function. So So we consider phi of x equal to e to the x. Okay, which of course is convex. Okay, and then you have the interval 0, 1. And you divide it into n sub interval of the same length. Okay? Um, so 1 up to n. So you have uh, uh, call them so i1, i, you know them with i, i. And you have that the measure of i, i is equal to 1 over n, okay? And of course, these are disjoint. Okay, now, uh, so somehow we fix our choice for the convex function. And now, in order to apply the Jensen inequality, we have also to fix a choice for the integrable function. So, and this would be done in terms of these uh, intervals. So, we will we will define the function f as uh, the sum, the linear combination of the characteristic function of uh, i i, where the coefficients will be fixed later, OK? <coughs> the coefficients are alpha i, and I will choose them later. Okay, so we want to compute the two parts which appear in, in the Jensen inequality. So we have that, so let me go down here. Okay, you have that exponential of the sum of alpha i q i t this is equal to e to the sum of alpha i times 1 over n and this is dot okay this is the first part the other one is the integral of the exponential of this one of course okay so this is equal to what this is equal to the sum over j j goes from 1 to n of you can just consider the integral you can split this all this integral into the integral over the f this in the integral over this interval i j of the sum of alpha i k i and moreover what you have if you observe that You observe that we have that the integral over ij 
of this, this exponential of the sum in dt, this is equal to just the integral over ij or e alpha ij, because the other one, uh, the other terms are equal to 0 outside uh, ij. And OK, so this is equal. Finally, what you get is this is equal to the sum over j of integral of ij e alpha j equal to and this is two dot so you combine uh, one dot with two dot and then which what remains to to fix are the choice of alpha j so if you want to take the same here, but of course it's, this is not important. Okay, so if you set if we set alpha j to be the logarithm of beta j, this is possible because our beta j was positive, strictly positive, then we have that or you have that E on over N is equal to And so we are done, okay? This concludes, yeah. Uh, uh, this is for the Jensen inequality, no? You have to combine this. Dot and two dot are the two parts, are the two sides uh, of the Jensen inequality for the special choice of phi and, and f. If you check, uh, I mean, this is for the Jensen inequality. <laughs> OK. So uh, we start by saying that to, to calculating um, the left-hand side of the Jensen inequality for our special choice of phi and f. Uh, and we saw that this is equal to this. Then we come with the second, uh, mm, the right hand side of the Jensen inequality for our special choice of phi and f, and we saw that these are equal to this. So we combine, so we combine the two, and we use uh, the Jensen inequality, and you have this uh, this inequality. Okay, you're not convinced. <laughs> it, it is, it is, it's, I mean, it's simple. It's just because of the Jensen inequality. And so we are done. And
and uh, okay just let me introduce a brief um, result concerning a new argument actually and, um, and then we can stop Okay, this uh, concerns somehow uh, the LP spaces. This will be uh, so the last argument of the course. Somehow are the spaces which has of function we have that has the pith power integrable. Okay, so the first theorem would be uh, the Young inequality. So you start from A and B to positive number, no negative, and you take some lambda in R and uh, lambda is in between 0 and 1. Okay, then we have the following. A lambda times B, 1 minus lambda, is less or equal than the sum of lambda A plus Y minus lambda um, B. Um, Okay, somehow, I mean, either we prove it, but um, I will prove it anyway, but of course this is some, you can see it as a special instance of the, of the Jensen inequality, okay? Or what we just proved here. Okay, so, We define uh, the function f of t equal to lambda t plus 1 minus lambda uh, minus t lambda for t positive. Okay, we do the derivative m of t equal to lambda plus minus lambda t lambda minus one and okay I collect lambda one minus t minus one. Um, so we have that prime of t is equal to zero if and only if t is equal to one and moreover, we have that it is f is increasing, so the derivative is positive for t uh, larger than 1 and uh, is negative for t less than 1. So we have that f as a minimum, um, yes, f as a minimum in t equal to 1. And uh, so we have that since we have t equal to 1 is a minimizer. And since f1 there is equal to 0, then we have then for any t which is different from 1, we have that f of t is positive. Okay, 
So what we want to prove is that lambda a plus 1 minus lambda b is larger or equal than a lambda b 1 minus lambda. So in particular, what this means that lambda a plus 1 minus lambda b minus a lambda b 1 minus lambda is uh, larger or equal than 0. So call this star. And now we have that if b is equal to 0, this is trivial. Otherwise, we can divide for b. OK, if b is equal to 0, then star is trivial. OK, if b is positive, then you are, you are allowed to, to divide. So you have that this becomes lambda a plus 1 minus lambda b minus a lambda b 1 minus lambda is equal to, so you collect b here, and then you have lambda uh, times a divided by b plus 1 minus lambda minus um, <coughs> a lambda b um, to the minus lambda, no? a b, OK? So if you put, let t equal to a over b, then somehow we are done. So you have that okay. So we have that for what we saw before for any t different from one. So when a and b are, are different, um, we have that b f of t is positive. OK, then we are done for t different from 1. And uh, moreover, we have that f of t is equal to 0 if and only if t is equal to 1, if and only if a is equal to b. And this tells you that the young for the young inequality, you have the equality the equality in the I if and only if a is equal to lambda, OK? That in the young inequality, the <coughs> quality sign holds um, if and only if a is equal to b, OK? So this proves the, the theorem. OK, so on Tuesday we will go on with the TLP spaces. So for today, I think we are done.